my name is Alexander Primak. I did my PhD in, at the University of Southampton. I've been studying computer science, how large societies behave. Well, I've been using lots of tricks, lots of graphs, and sometimes to protest the data, you need to have interesting data structures to work with. And in this talk, I'm going to briefly introduce you to the most interesting data structures and some tricks, which are very useful. Uh, this is going to be quite introductory and maybe intermediate talk with some code examples. You don't need to code anything. I'm going to show you the code. And uh, to seek for deeper answers, you, you should be following maybe some references I'll give you later. So uh, probabilistic data structures and approximate solutions. So why for these things? Um, often um, approximate answer is good enough. And uh, you don't need uh, to have Spock or Spook, uh, Spock actually from Star Trek, who was always giving you the very accurate answer, which sounded always ridiculous. You sometimes want to know an estimate. And uh, if I will transfer you the precise figure in millions how many people are there in the UK, uh, that won't be that informative. All you need is the order of magnitude. And so actually, sometimes it's good enough. So, and most interesting, we need to trade accuracy for scalability or speed. And this is what all the structures designed for. Uh, you should always bear that in mind that uh, you will lose the accuracy. So all these message tricks have a margin error. Uh, good ones will also give you bounds on that error. And actually this is the first indicator. If you are starting a structure and uh, a method which doesn't have any bounds of its error or confidence. You should be better giving up on that. And uh, they're very good to analyze streams of data. When you have like infinite, theoretically infinite streams of data and you want to do something with that without storing them. So catch. Um, typically, you will get good results. Expected value is good. But there is always chance of bad worst case behavior. And uh, yeah, we'll take a look on some of those. And uh, you should be always thinking, if you remember, law of large numbers from course of statistics, which was telling you that the more you sample, the more accurate your estimated mean will be. And so never use anything like probabilistic or approximate for small data sets. It just, you will be getting this worst case behavior all the time. It's not for that. So it's always good to know what it's not for. Um, so. Approximation, it's a very simple thing. What we are thinking about approximation? It's when we need to calculate an exact answer. And for example, here, um, I want to get an average of very large array. It's uh, uh, random, 10,000 randoms of uh, numbers between zero and 1800. So average should be somewhere 1400, right? This is, will be the whole set. Uh, this set is going to be a tricky one, we're going to remove eight bits from each number. And so we actually will going to reduce the size of the set. Each number will reduce by 10,000 uh, bytes, the whole data set. And the last one, it's going to be five person sample. Actually, this, is, this set is already uniform because I drew it from random generator, so I'm just taking a slice. I don't need to make a choice. And here, I'm taking averages. This one, I'm adding those eight bits back. I removed two to power eight. And uh, on results, you actually can see that error rate is very manageable. And we are getting very close to those 40,000. And I would rather say that it's somewhere in the margin of error, very close to that initial data set. So as you can see, actually, we can deal with 5% of data set and being perfect. People sometimes forget that we can sample data. And it's always important for you to remember is that when you test it, you sample. And you test your code in the sample. But actually, you can do that in production as well. And there is no need sometimes to deal with Hadoop and people right now just throwing money because they can. And some, sometimes wrong. So uh, sampling data, just we run this issue for approximation. So this is like classical interview question. Get some samples 
of an infinite stream, sample infinite stream. Have you ever came across with this question? No, how you would approach it? Any ideas? There used to be, uh, excuse me? No, I want to get a fair sample of an infinite stream. And this stream is infinite. Actually, the real question which uh, a friend of mine been asked on Google interview, I believe it's not being asked anymore. And it, it has very nice and precise answer. Firstly, let's think that that set isn't infinite. It's just very large. So uh, we're not dealing with overflowing anything. It, we have to put ourselves into context. Any ideas? Every five seconds. Every five seconds. Good. But I want to have k, k samples. I want to have 10 elements. So every five seconds, if I'll be picking a, an element, I will have only last uh, 10 seconds. It's no. Actually, it's a nice idea. I like it. No, I didn't do it that way, but actually it can work, I believe. But the thing is, yes, uh, there will be a problem with uh, what has been offered, that we take a uh, distribution, exponential distribution, which describes a wait time in Poisson process, and we draw according to this distribution. So it more or less will resemble that we are randomly picking cars from a traffic. It's, it's what that was offered. But there is a problem. We will still be ending up with the last cars, with the last few cars that we picked up according to the distribution. And so when this stream moves, we'll forget our f previous elements. Good, good. Just, just, okay. It's just, well, I think it's time to develop it to some code sample. So it's going to be very simple. Okay, sampling. I'm taking, excuse me. Ah, uh, here it is. I'm taking the same large, large vector of 10,000 elements. And I'm seeding the sample. It's a trick. I need to, sam to have something in the sample, so I need a one. And <coughs> it will be gone as soon as we'll get those 10 elements. And then I'm just looping over this stream. It can be stream, just here is a vector. And I'm assigning to each element an index. Uh, this is a virtual index. It's non-existing index, which is random number. To every new element I see, next one, I'm assigning random index. And this can be sorted according to this random index. And I'm then taking a look in my uh, sample set. My sample set is actually this index, which is randomly assigned index, and uh, an element out of set which I want to sample. And uh, I'm taking a look on maximum uh, index in my sample. If it's lower than randomly generated numbers, and I'm taking this uh, element into into my sample, and uh, if I got already too many elements or more than I had, I'm just deleting the one with a maximum random number. So I made a virtual index. It's very very simple trick and very efficient. Works, and uh, yeah, sure you can write code trickier, make it nicer, but that's how you sample and you. And you can deal with infinite stream of data which you don't need to store because the usual answer of people, this is a catch why it was question infinite. People want to store and then somehow index, uh, randomly generate indexes and get it. But we can actually create an index on fly. Uh, so next things which we'll be going to talk about is these are actually probabilistic data structures that will be dealing with samples or somehow describing our elements. What are they really for? Are they 
usually for optimization. Is it used less space than the uh, original data structure? But they are very specific. Each of those data structures is designed for specific use. They require sometimes higher CPU load to access it. Uh, they require sometimes higher CPU load, but we always trade for space and general, we uh, reduce number of operations that we execute. So even if uh, an individual operation of accessing element, checking something against element is more expensive, on average it's much cheaper. And consider that CPU is cheap right now. We are limited by bandwidth, we're limited by memory. Uh, they're stream friendly as a sample because we can deal with data without <coughs> Uh, storing the whole data set, we just can aggregate it somehow. Uh, it can be parallelized in many cases. Uh, we can calculate those structures on different computers even and later merge them. It's a nice property of some structures. And uh, most of them are well established in academia and they have controlled error rate. And it's very, very important. When you'll be dealing it and you want to, I'm just reminding one, once more, you want to be sure that the structure you're choosing is, you can trust it. Check if it has confidence on its performance, confidence rates. If it doesn't, maybe just tricky structure or maybe nobody investigated. Then just do maybe empirically, well, some check empirically if it will help you. But you should be cautious if it doesn't. So, the first thing that you should know is hash function. You must have heard of, of many of those. You heard uh, CRC, SSH, MD5, I'm sure, right? So we just remind ourselves what are those. It's when you take a key, you take a, some hash function, and it somehow magically maps into hash. So key, which Games and entrance can be of arbitrary length. It's very, very important. We can take there a film of four gigabyte and just take a hash and later verify in torrent network if what we downloaded matches to what I requested by comparing those has hashes. And, uh, uh, and we get a fixed length of a message or an outcome. This is a hash code. Simple function. It's one-way function we cannot get from a key back to, to the message. And uh, I'm sorry, from the message, which is hashed back to the key. Uh, this is used quite often in uh, encryption, and you know that a lot of those hash functions are used, like Bcrypt right now, but those are not we're going to talk about today. And they have collisions. It's also, I think, you know, if you deal with any of those some of those different elements may map to, to the same hash. And well, this is where we became in probabilistic and approximate in all these structures. So some code sample. So how the simplest hash work works? It's a lose-lose hash. It's known hash algorithm is quite old by classical computer uh, science, it's when you just take in a string on the entrance and um, summarize all its characters as integers. And that's it, it's called lose-lose. So here we have two different hashes for, for this function. Well, this function is prone to the problems. Uh, one is being tested, it has lots of collisions, and this is very bad. We want a hash function which uh, as randomly as possible distributes its hashes. So we will have less and less collisions. So there is another one, very classical one, DJB2. It has magic numbers, and it's how in general all hash functions look. They do some magic transformation with a key, shifting by five, uh, getting the prime number in, and again, multiplying um, string uh, character uh, number. And it works much better, actually. And it gives you fairly good distribution if your actually input, your keys are fairly good distributed. Well, here is you get some output. 
And sure, we have lots of built-in Python. We don't need to know, develop a well. MG5, SSH5, they are standard, and many of those you can find if you install OpenSSL. But there is a trick with that. All these functions, some of them are were designed for cryptographic, and you are not be using, you shouldn't be using cryptographic functions for data analysis. Uh, some of them are like uh, SSH are very quick. They perform quite quickly, quite well. But in general, uh, modern like bcrypt, they are very slow on purpose to prevent people uh, than decrypting by basically scanning through the whole possible keys and getting a message and getting your password cracked using the salt they may be stolen. So we want something that's actually very, very quick. And uh, sure, there are many of those. One of those I'm going to show you, it's Murmur. Sounds interesting. It's this one. It looks like hash function. Nothing, nothing to, to you to worry about. So here we'll take a look better on results. So cryptographic hashes are not ideal. Seek for hashes if you do any data analysis or you trying to use hash algorithms, use something like Murmur. It's uh, tested right now on this is test from somewhere from Stack Exchange. Uh, one of the most popular uh, hash algorithms for this uses against uh, lose lose, uh, which I showed you on three different data sets. It's lowercase uh, dictionary of English words random UIDs generator and numbers, sequence of numbers. And Murmur is quite good. It gives you six collision on somewhere like several thousand hundred of words. And here are sample collisions. Uh, it cannot differentiate, for example, shoal from storm bound. Well, so other functions are, as you see, actually, not that far behind. Maybe some of them are slower on this case. Maybe on this case are equally similar, but clearly lose lose has insane number of uh, it's collisions. It's 20, well, it's like a quarter of that data set is in collisions. So um, so why Murmur actually? Why don't we to take uh, all those hashes from the whole dictionary and it'll be like very long, then we'll take a hash of each word, put a very long vector, uh, it's like one axis and we'll then uh, cut it online just to make it nice square and we'll light a pixel where we had a hash. We'll get this hash map, very nice hash map. Color is just to make it nice. It's not mine, disregard color. But the most interesting, and it's very visual, you can see that it's kind of random and you feel very happy with that. Then you throw a much more sophisticated data set. You set sequence of number and it's much harder for hash algorithms sometimes to differentiate very similar strings which are just one character different and what happens with weaker like dgb2 which i showed you in that code example you see that actually there are gaps and it's clearly that those multiplications and shifts which we've seen happening as a code quite simple ones they aggregate hashes around some clusters and this is bad. So we clearly see that half of our hash space isn't used and we have potentially much higher number of collisions. Uh, just to give you a feeling what's happening inside of the hash algorithm. But not always we want to have hashes to be different. We sometimes want to, for two different strings to return similar hashes. And this is where it starts interesting because all of those things I believe you know, maybe something new will, come, will be coming. And uh, it's called scientifically locality sensitive hashing. It's when we have a similar objects, we want them to have similar hash to compare without actually comparing field to field. And there are algorithms including text search algorithms which are using these tricks. And this is one of the simplest one. It uh, brings document that you want to compare. Uh, these hashes were developed in order to differentiate between um, documents in early search engines. Right now they're using a similar algorithm but much more powerful. I believe it's AltaVista, this one. They had like lots of servers which were crawling websites and they wanted to know that actually this is the same website. Maybe something changed 
between two of those different crawls, but we actually got the same page. And so this is, was the first stage to compare hashes. And they were developing similar things. They were taking document, splitting into feature. Feature, it's actually chunks of text. Uh, think of that like we take every three characters. And this is the feature. Then we hash this feature. <coughs> then we, in this case, weights are all ones. And then we take uh, multiplying them by these weights and we just mm, see if bit is up, it's minus, it's bit is zero, it's plus. And we're getting just a sum. Sounds like ridiculously simple cal calculations. If one minus weight, if another plus weight. And we're getting, when we're adding all of them together, some function. Sure, it's not going to be uh, randomly distributed because we're doing quite little of permutation and should be there in other document, this one bit has changed. Only one uh, simple element will be changed and this is hash function. Uh, it will be very close to, to the one with other bit there. I'll show you how it looks, this code. It's bits, yeah, and it's going to be harder for me to show you on this screen. Uh, it was nicer on my large resolution, but at least you'll be able to see something. Uh, there are lots of, uh, firstly, uh, implementation in Python. You don't need to implement those things, just Google for them. And even in just, you can install any of those by pip. This one I took from pip, I just a bit simplified it to fit it. Um, it just initializes hash object on this screen, uh, and it just calls function build by text using some values, which we, uh, well, maybe we should care. This is the number of uh, features. So we're chunking our input value. We're chunking it for 64 features. It's a regular expression to uh, tokenize it. Uh, and here we tokenize features using that regexp, and then sliding through the content. And for each feature, here we, after build these features, we basically performing the function you've seen on that algorithm. We're taking a hash function uh, and doing very simple permutations using some tricks. Uh, believe me, it's just a pearl version of what you've seen on this slide. And then you have very simple distance. Uh, how to compare distance between hashes? It actually has been shown. Have you heard of cosine distance? How to compare distance between vectors? Okay, I'll show you later on another slide how it looks like. But uh, basically we check how many bits are different between two different hashes. And it's uh, been proven to be very reliable distance. And so here, how it looks. So you clearly see that Inputs are quite different for those hashes. Similarly, despite there are only a few changes in those lines, they somehow close, but they're different. Still very different from this one, despite uh, inserting only a few spaces. And here, let's see how they're comparing distances. So distance zero between comparing it to itself. Distance 12, when I started to type in teenager way. And, uh, and some, I don't know, some distance when I wrote completely different uh, phrase. These distances don't have a metric. It just abstract values. You, you have to bear it in mind. And it's an experimental way, and it depends on hash and algorithm which you use, how to set up the threshold of comparison. Um, so there are a few of those locality sensitive hashing algorithms, and uh, they are very powerful. I love them. You don't need to go into your database, you can just compare hashes and be sure that you got the same document. But it's going to be more interesting. Do you know how Google Images works? Locality sensitive hashing. Well, not really, but if we to implement it. So this is a paper which implements quite well side paper. Uh, I think it's 200, it's not 22. And this is a sample of um, that how their hashing algorithm detected and grouped together images. So they designed the hash algorithm which 
uh, for images with similar features provides the nearest distance. And then you're just measuring distance between different hashes, not between I images, which is computationally quite cheap. They were able to cluster these images and show their accuracy. Quite scientific, believe me. And you can find those examples. You can find numerous examples about that. Uh, from my uh, experience, what I've been uh, playing with, which was quite interesting, um, we were designing another hash function uh, with the supervision of my curator on Bachelor. He was using us as a testing devices. So we were calculating for him hashes of um, contours of images. And we were coming up different ridiculous uh, hashes in order to then verify one against each other. Sometimes it's just tricky way of trial and error. So our professor just threw a bunch of students and he made like real genetic algorithm, which student will came up with a better hash to compare two different contours. That worked. So this is the whole problem was to recognize number plates and uh, we were given images which had already contours of the numbers. And we, the whole idea of the project was to develop uh, the most efficient algorithm for uh, character recognition which can work even on embedded microcontroller. That was a bit back in time, that it was right now we can put Raspberry Pi. I don't care about that, but sometimes you have uh, 50 million images in your product database and you want to find similar one, which is, uh, takes us back. So next are finally uh, real probabilistic data structures. Those that were before and we were discussing before, those were tricks and uh, uh, basics that you will need to understand to progress with that, any of those. So the first probabilistic data structure and as any it will follow is designed for a particular purpose. This one is for membership <coughs> test. We are given a very large stream of data and we want to uh, get only, only unique elements, for example. And we want to check against our existing database, have you seen it before, have you seen it before? And that would be very costly if we to consider that that's a database of images, for example. So we can calculate a hash of image, not similarity hash, but more more, very randomized hash. And, uh, and then with these hashes, we will be doing the following tricks. Uh, we will uh, populate a bitmap of length of m bits, which is usually rather long, which I've been using are coming up to megabytes and for very large data sets, 100 megabytes, but consider that that data set is several terabytes, it's, it's a trade-off. And then I'm taking uh, several different hash algorithms or quite often hash algorithms, say hash algorithm can be feed, feed it with different seeds to provide different hashes. It's, it's being done in order to improve quality of this algorithm. And according to these hashes, this hash yields for us some answer. For example, it yields us uh, three different numbers which indicate where we should be looking at in our bitmap. And when we insert a, something into a uh, Bloom filter bitmap, which initially initialized all with zeros, we just check all this cells to which we were appointed and flip them to ones. And that's it. This is a problem. We can only write to Bloom filter. You cannot delete elements from Bloom filter. There are extensions, but in classical, we cannot delete an element from, from Bloom filter. And then when you want to check element against Bloom filter, you just calculating these hashes for this element very similar way and just checking back these elements. If at least one of those bits is turned to zero, this means that your element that you are checking is definitely not in this Bloom filter, not in list, it guaranteed. But if they are all of ones, uh, it's probably in the set. You probably have seen it. This is where a probabilistic kicks in. As you've seen before, we have problems that uh, hashes collide. And even despite we had several different hashes, they will collide, collisions often. And um, 
if you, if you insert it into small bitmap, a uh, very large number of elements, you basically flooded it always once. And whatever you'll be checking against it, it'll be saying that it exists there. So there is a trade-off. And you have to calculate the number of uh, bits you need, basically the size of bitmap, a number of hash functions to use. And with a very grounded theory, you came up with a probabilistic guarantee that this filter will work uh, with this error rate for this number of elements. So why we need them? Um, actually, we're using them. All of you are using them. If you're using databases, you're using them. For example, clearly in HBase, and I believe in other databases, uh, just it's not transparent in HBase, you can manually set it up. It has Bloom filter. Before going into very slow storage to retrieve your element, it check against, checks against the Bloom filter if this element I've seen before. And uh, it's being populated while you insert something into database or while database is being re-indexed. Uh, sure, there will be a collision and maybe Bloom filter will mistakenly uh, say that this element exists in database and you will go into database but this is it'll be one percent of chance, in 90 90 percent of chance, you will do zero disk seeks, restoring all hash map of your database in like several megabytes in memory, which sounds like a lot of improvement. So this is one of the use. The second of the use that uh, I think I'll I'll be showing you here. Sorry, it's for use. I shouldn't be creating very long snippets. I'm sorry. Excuse me? Why F11? Oh, it used to be F11, I'm sorry. I messed up. So here is a Bloom filter. Uh, all these libraries implemented sure in C, they just compiled with Cython or just directly C and you plug in as a library. Doesn't matter. You're using Python and you're just benefiting of efficiency of this library behind it. There are pure Python implementations which I don't recommend to use because, well, it'll be dramatic difference in performance. But here how it works. You populate Bloom filter, and this Bloom filter implementation is very neat. You just uh, tell it cardinality, your expected cardinality of your set. Uh, you can approximate it, just a uh, problem of Fermi, how many unique elements you're going to see, and what's your accepted error rate, 1%. And it calculates for you all those hidden variables, such as the size of this hash map, and uh, parameters of hash algorithms to use. And then you can store it in a file, and you can read it from a file, and just it's sometimes very great. For example, I'm just storing all Unix dictionary into this structure, and checking and it instantly gives you replies. Um, so if you want to get back to that a random example of uh, getting unique numbers, I have random vector of numbers, 500 elements. Here they are random. I have proven by showing you 20 first ones. And then I'm taking Bloom filter, which is very small. I know that actually those random numbers I have, can have only 20 different elements. I'm being optimistic. Uh, always I'm saying maximum cardinality is 30, 1% accuracy. And I'm just storing all of those. I'm looping through those random numbers. If it's not in the set, add to the set, this function actually, uh, this method adds element to a set and yields true or false if it has seen this, set, this element before in the set. If it uh, was before, uh, wasn't before, I just been added to this list and then I'm sorting and hooray, I got from zero to 19. So yeah, I got all unique elements from a random vector. Well, usually you're not going to use this uh, for this need. What I've been using before is uh, you can actually peek into uh, structure, it's just huge hash map, but for some reason my IPython hangs when I'm trying to do it. Uh, what I've been using this for, I have a, a list of, I have logs, which are full of users, They're just cookies. And uh, I want to sample that. I don't want to uh, deal with 
well, it's like terabytes of data for a month, several terabytes of data. It's like ridiculous. I want to have a fair sample. I'm just taking them all by their uh, units. And uh, the problem is that I have them in different logs. Those users have been doing different actions and they were stored in different places. And I then want to merge those logs. And it's going to be tricky if you are to do this on uh, uh, merging one data set. For example, I have a sample of a million of users and I'm trying to merge it against several terabyte of data. I, I need somehow to just to loop through. So I'm putting all this unique users into Bloom Filter. This is tiny utility I've written. And uh, uh, it just scans through input. Uh, if the, this file was given, it just picks up a file existing to which I already stored all users. And then if it's present in the element, I'm just outputting it. And with this, I can just very quickly, and actually I can parallelize this very easily uh, to, to sample users. Or maybe I want to get only unique uh, bot names from our log files. This is the way how it can be done quite quickly. Well, blue filters are very, well, popular, and there are many extensions to them, numerous extensions. And um, for example, people are extending them by letting them forget information. This is a question of uh, if you're dealing with streams of data and you want to discard all results. Then people are trying to Basically, you can deal with, do the same by having two blue filters and just when the one full and the other half full, you just discard it, you will have just sudden drops. But there, there are extensions for that. Uh, the problem is that none of them is actually giving you ability to always correct, identify uh, that element has not been seen because of those hash collisions. And this is interesting thing, how you can use Bloom filters and how they are used on very large scale. People which are doing metagenomics, and this is a very interesting for me, I've been listening for their talks just from curiosity. They um, analyze genes of lots of bacteria. They take a whole bunch of bacteria. Well, it's hard to do, it's a sample from the heat. They do DNA sequencing on the whole sample and they end up with uh, short um, strings which are representing bits of their DNA sequences which are all mixed and they're just one species being split it into thousands of those chunks and we have hundred species and, and then you end up with a soup of those chunks. But uh, this is like a tricky thing. Um, what they do, they put all this information as a graph into Bloom filter because they are not able just to reconstruct that graph uh, for metagenomics problem even for with computational power we have just because it is becoming too expensive for them. They are dealing with some margin of error. So what they do, they just take this uh, chunk of DNA and they uh, agree on the sample window. We may think of this as a word, four characters, and they take four characters and uh, map it to the fixed character. And uh, they just put it into blue filter, this five character. Then they actually just in DNA are limited to four characters. They test, then they discard the first character and add four different characters in the front and test which of them exists in the blue filter. And so they move step by step, trying all different direction in this graph development. It just, um, in genetics, you have only four different bases, so it's quite feasible to do. And here are the tests that they did. Uh, they basically, this is each tiny element of this circle is a substring, which predicts another character of next substring, and they're just basically lots of overlapping substrings. And this is when we set in accuracy to the highest level. And we are learning a loop of those uh, genetic bases. You can then recreate them very easily because our accuracy is extremely high. Should you add margin of error of one person, you already see that it's not recovering sequence correctly. 
And this is somewhere on margin of only 70, 60% error. And it still is able to discover, well, circle de dependency, which is amazing. And uh, quite a lot of research done in this. And uh, just fascinated with them. Let's move further. So uh, it's all on streams. And uh, we already checked if element is a stream. We can filter streams with Bloom filter. Uh, but how to count distinct elements? Well, Bloom filter doesn't provide this information. There is a extension for that which can help you, but it's very inaccurate. So there are special structures for that. We have infinite suite of data. Again, how many distinct elements are there? You'll be surprised, but actually it's similar to coin flips. How many times, uh, if I record coin flips, how many times actually I flipped a coin? And I'm going to illustrate you this. It's simpler than you think. Just illustration will help you a little. So we are flipping lots of coins. And uh, longest run of zeros it actually correlates. Uh, I have intuition here. When I'm uh, long of running heads uh, of these coins, are very ra rare if you to, s to flip a coin and 10 times in a row, you will have a head. But the longer you look, the more likely you will be able to see one. And there was a video of a guy who actually thrown on a camera 10 times in a row head of a coin. And it was like, well, amazing on the internet, it's like not fair coin, but actually he wrote that he was throwing coin continuously for nine hours. And just that, that the very end when it happened, I uh, know they were filming it for some scientific purposes. So these long runs are very rare, and they correlated with how uh, many times, with how many coins you have flipped. So how it works? So the first function just uh, generate coins flips, hmm, nothing. The second function is just calculates this is in this sequence number the maximum number of uh, zeros that are we are following each other. I just goes in a loop. I just initialize some counter. Go in a loop. If it's zero, count plus one. Else, just drop the counter and check if the counter meanwhile was more than maximum and update the maximum. It's very simple. And then. Uh, you just, uh, this is actually how it's been executed. Those two functions are bunched, bunched together. And this is a very interesting stuff begins. So when we do this 100 times, that function that uh, we're about was to aggregate around a large number of experiments, and we plot distributions. So we 100 times through 100 coins. Here's how a histogram looks. So, uh, how often we can see excuse me so uh, what the lengths of uh, zeros maximum lengths of zeros uh, that um, we uh, have seen in that variable. They're distributed ac according to this mean distribution, which is a little bit skewed, and it's actually maximized somewhere near six. And the most interesting is that uh, we expect this to, I'm sorry, something didn't print well here. I'll rerun these bits of code. Excuse me. I'm being confused by my own slides. Sometimes happens. If you, uh, to remind yourself that actually we did a hundred run, and you will just take a logarithm base two from hundred, you're magically getting this same number. 
which means that actually you need to take the longest number of zeros you have seen in the sequence, take two to power of this number, and you will approximate the number of coin flips that you had. This is for a uh, longer run, for 500 runs, for 1,000 coins. And this time estimate is even closer. We see it's being estimated somewhere around nine, and we expect it to be somewhere around nine theoretically. So this is very simply how this coin flips calculation happens. But you just notice that we, uh, we can calculate with this anything because we can take any data, we can convert into this random flips of coin by taking hashes out of each element of this data. And uh, assuming that those hashes are randomly distributed, it will be approximation of those flips. So, and this is uh, known as cardinality estimation problem. And this is uh, also this algorithm is a basic description of which is called log-log uh, uh, cardinality estimation. We hash each item into bit strength, count trailing zeros in bit strength, and uh, intuition is very simple. It's very rare you see lots of zeros ahead or at the end of a binary number. But the longer you see, and considering that it's in random numbers, the more likely you will see lots of leading or trailing zeros. And we're just taking this number and remembering it. And then we're just estimating cardinality by uh, how many distinct elements we had by taking two to power of those leading or trailing zeros in those bit strings which were representing uh, each element. There are problems with this. And um, problems are that uh, estimated are not accurate. Have you seen those distributions? And those distributions, you should have taken lots of uh, experiments in order to get a realistic mean, and you've seen it's skewed, you can always get with a single experiment in one of the ends, and uh, your particular taste, uh, case when you'll be running this on a data set, you will be in one of those cases. You cannot run many times, or you have to run with different hash algorithms. And uh, that gives you, it ends up with lots of problems and collisions. So it's the best thing uh, to date, which has been developed, is called hyperloglog. -log. Uh, it's basically, takes in account uh, problems with uh, uh, log log and uh, I'm sorry I'll be able to show you probably the nice demo uh, this kind guy has developed for us uh, which uh, also works uh, in some way similar to previous structures we've seen it has a register variables, which is a map, but it's not a beep map, it's a map of uh, values. For each incoming uh, value, it takes a hash. It chunks a bit of this hash and uses this as, as an index of a new value in these registers. Uh, why it does so? It's just basically trying to bucket uh, different hashes into different beans so they will have less collisions in total. And this is a very important number also in calculating the accuracy of this method. And then it uses the rest of the uh, register values which are assigned and calculates number of, uh, in this case, will be trailing zeros plus one. Because it's original algorithm which was published, it was, it was using plus one. And then it just sees its register value is uh, zero actually here, no trailing zeros, but plus one. And this register index gives us place where to add this number. And uh, for example, here we have three, two leading zeros plus one. Register index is here, we are adding three here. And if we run, you will see that this map became filled with numbers. And they're rising and actually it calculates something. Nice. 
and uh, it coincides. We have a formula how to uh, extract back from this register value uh, uh, cardinality of a set that we were analyzing. And this formula is here. Uh, basically, it's some constant which uh, these smart guys uh, divide by uh, multiplied by square of number of bins to which we uh, sort our data, which is 64 in our case. And then it summarizes for all those bins to the power of uh, this register index we've stored. And uh, so far, it says its error is zero in that set. Oh, it should be, should be lying. I think it's not run till the very end. But the most impressive, you can uh, estimate billions of distinct, distinct values in like two kilobytes of memory, and it was only 2% error. This is amazing. If you just do want to monitor what's happening in your data set, do monitoring of your any streams of data, this is, this is brilliant. Sometimes, uh, let's take a look of code. Not very smart people wrote this code, but you better be fine in that uh, direct implementation. Actually, it doesn't need to be C. It's very simple and it's Python. You can disregard these two values. These are internal parameters of this algorithm, which are just, you see, it looks like fixed uh, constants depending on the size of bit. And then estimated cardinality, which basically uh, does that function which I showed you before, which is harmonic mean. It's just a way how to summarize, it's a type of average, how to summarize values from that map. And uh, some magic corrections, which are well justified in a scientific paper. Frankly, I haven't gone into that. I just trusted them by empirical evidence in their citation. It works. And uh, this is how it works. We choose pre precisions. And uh, it calculates this example for our precisions. Uh, how many packets do we need to have for those bits? And uh, libraries that you are most likely to use, this will be hidden behind the API similar as it uh, was in the Bloom filter. So you'll be just saying precisions that you want. And that's it, or in the, your estimated cardinality. So, here, uh, I'm sorry, I'm losing my own slides again. Slides again. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm going to skip this because uh, seriously, I got caught myself. Mm. I can explain it maybe after a break what was, was going on there. Then how actually adding a number to a uh, uh, hyperlog log, we calculate any number that came in string and take in this case SSH, doesn't matter. It's well good, it's quite quick, it works with String though, and gives you back a string. Then we uh, determine uh, which are first bits we're getting index of this bucket, and for the remaining bits, which are ac saying actually uh, w in which we identify number of uh, trailing zeros, we just chunk them together, identify number of trailing zeros, and in this bin, which was taken from one part of hash, <coughs> we just drop this estimator. We update it by um, putting their maximum from what we've seen on this run 
against uh, what is already stored there. And uh, here how it works. We estimate in cardinality of uh, 1,000 uh, digits, which just happen to be randomly, in this case, sequence. And we are, we are somewhere off. Sorry, what happens? Excuse me. It's, we are driving, we're just taking a sample of 1,000 digits with a number of uh, 1 billion or 100 million from zero. I'm very sorry, I, I should take a break, sorry, for a few minutes right now. Should, do you have any questions to previous material that we have? Yes, please. probabilistic part that uh, doesn't guarantee, you don't have a guarantee that similar elements are uh, leading to the same hash. And you neither do, don't have a guarantee that different elements are leading to, uh, not, don't have a collision. So this is was a probabilistic element to this. Okay, I caught up already with what's happening here, why I didn't get a number which I wanted, because I updated hyperlog log twice. So uh, here, just it happens that after uh, defining a function, um, this add num, which adds element to a hyperlog log, I already run once a code which populates it, and uh, I threw into 1,000 elements, and I got cardinality estimation of 94,000, which is underestimation. And then I'm just happening to be throwing again another 100,000 num numbers, which actually, together with those, add to 200,000. And that's why I'm getting 196,000, which is just 4,000 short from the real number of uh, unique elements, which might not be, this number might be even closer to real value because if you remember I'm drawing random numbers and they are happen to be sometimes the, sim the same ones. So this cardinality of the set uh, will be less the number of uh, numbers I have added to it. Finally, I'm very sorry. Uh, we're getting lost right now. So we a bit shy on, on this and 
we still can update it. Back to the second, uh, to the following structure. So we calculated number of elements, but this is not enough. We, sometimes we want to know actually how many times we've seen each element, which is an uh, interesting thing. And uh, you should consider that basically you want to build a frequency list for a stream. If you have infinite number of distinct elements, most likely you, you won't be able to. But if you are trying to build a distribution of where your users are coming from, from which countries they're coming from. And uh, in this case, you just know countries are limited. We have 200 countries. <laughs> Let's just build a frequency histogram. But what will happen if you want to build this for user agents, which are not actually limited, and you can have anything there, including bots and uh, everyday new version of your user agent. So we can use this thing. Actually, this is a bit, it's again a register map as in uh, uh, hyperlog log. We have rows which are getting some values from different hashes. And we have widths, actually it's a depth for each of uh, this row. And we take in a value which we want to uh, store or later calculate uh, cardinality, take a hash which corresponds to each row in the structure, and which this hash yields us index in this row where to look. And if we are inserting value into count means catch, we just plus one in each element. We're doing the same we did in Bloom filter, but Bloom filter we were using only one row and we were setting once. In this case, we're rising them. We every time adding plus one. And then later, when we want to calculate uh, actually what was the frequency for this element after we running for several days analyzing our log files, we just take in minimum of these cells this element addresses us to. And uh, because of hash <laughs> collisions, uh, we'll be trying to underestimate other elements being also storing some, some data into these uh, <laughs> cells. And we want to be sure that we will take the minimum one because the minimum one will be the most, the closest to the value of our data that we were counting. However, there is still a problem. Uh, count means catch will be overestimating because maybe one element has co collided on this cell, another collided on this cell, and one more collided on that cell. And it has risen for our element, which we're trying right now to estimate. It's risen its cardinality. There are boundaries on um, its accuracy, and they are depending on uh, total number of uh, elements of, on your, basically, width of your matrix and number of your hash codes. And uh, should you use any library, you will have also control over uh, these elements quite, quite nicely. So frequent it, uh, item sets. So this is another example which uh, actually is passed an implementation of, uh, um, of a sketch, which I've slightly simplified uh, in order to fit it in a slide, but it doesn't fit. <laughs> it takes in this case parameters, which you have to calculate directly through those formulas, uh, originals, and uh, does some control. Then it calculates for you the uh, width of matrix, the number of dimensions, and the nice interesting thing that I already, in this class, I included number of elements I want to sample. And uh, I want to get top 10 elements, which are the most frequent ones. If you remember, at the very beginning, we were discussing how to get 10 random elements from the infinite stream. Now the problem is how to get the 10 most frequent elements of the stream in to show you some stats. So this is, will be just a slightly tiny addition to count min sketch. This is an update function, which basically takes element in and also a parameter which says how many, seen, how many times you've seen it. It takes a hash function we defined in initializing of this class. And
and uh, hash functions yield several different uh, parameters, one of which defines a row into which we calculate. It's a dimension on row. And hash function is actually a column value. And then we're getting column and just going into row and column and incrementing it with an increment which is, in our case, always will be one. And there is another magic function which does update heap, which will try to look if this element is the most frequent in the whole table, and if it does, it will be stored into our frequent list. So, well, just it's awkwardly written, but it's quite straightforward. It uses its heap queue in order to optimize uh, its performance. But basically, all it does, it looks if its element happened to be one of the top highest in estimates and checks if it's already in the set and gets rid of elements it doesn't want to if we got it. And uh, get element. We want to get cardinality for each element. We're doing exactly the same we did in update value, but in this case we just take a minimum of all cells we've been writing to. And here is a hash function. So quite simple. We initialize it. We store element. We got the element. It says its cardinality is one. And, well, there is only one k element. So let's go back into that flip coins. It's longest run zeros. It's a very big trial of 500 trials, 1,000 coins flips in each. Here is the distribution. And so uh, let's uh, store all of those and uh, mm, trying to see what's the distribution of those leading zeros. So basically, I'm trying to find the mean of this distribution. And uh, I said that I want to store top five elements or top six elements. And they are coinciding with elements. The highest cardinality is the largest number of zeros continuously in that, el in that set, somewhere around eight, which is with coincides with this histogram plot. And uh, you can see that we have tiny number for 12, which are happen to be here, and we have nothing for longer tail. So it estimated number of uh, occurrences of those sequences of zeros. Good, so we can build a frequent item set, pop popular uh, browser agents on fly from any data stream. So what's next? And this is more about approximation solutions and this is about hacks. It's less scientific, uh, but more practical. And machine learning, if you all heard about, you have to deal with preparing your data for, for training, encoding data, cleaning data, finding which data uh, fields are uh, important, trying to evaluate how they correlate with each other, basically trying to reduce the cardinality of your data sets. You're trying to get rid of as many features as possible in order to train your algorithm quicker and more accurate. And there are different reasons for that. There is a trick for, though, for that though. You can take all features and hash them. And yeah, take the hash and use the hash as a single feature. So what it does, it actually, it's a very simple, it's a projection of all your features into, uh, into dot and multidimensional space, which is this hash vector. And uh, this is dirty hack, dirty hack. It most likely in practical, you will be able to find better way for constructing features for your training algorithms. But sometimes it does its work. And in particular, people are using that for training on uh, in NLP for doing very rough tasks. Um, so we take a hash, and for each word that actually yield us a hash, we uh, add a number into this vector, and we use this vector as a single value for classification for entering. This is uh, Andrew Clegg been explaining us how we've been doing this, and also he has showed us how actually to visualize. And if you remember, we were talking about cosine distance. So you, 
if you would be comparing me against somebody else, you can design all the features how we're different. Each feature will have its own axis, the length, tall, weight. And uh, if we to put the point which represents me on that axis, that would be basically a vector from starting to this point and the other person. And in order to avoid comparison of different features together, there is a very grounded method. We're just measuring cos cosine distance between those two vectors. It's a very classical approach. And what's tricky here, and uh, this is all called hash, uh, it's, a it's basically on local sensitive hashing in this case as well, but it's called hashing trick in machine learning. We are able to approximate this distance between two vectors as just bit distance between hashes. So it's Hamming, bitwise Hamming distance. We just calculate how many permutations we need to make in one uh, hash in order to get another one, basically a number of different bits. And this gives you very accurate uh, distance. And you can just assume that just relying on this, you can then put some hyperplanes in your space, or you can see that those hashes somehow are located somewhere nearby and classify your data, especially if you're using locality sensitive hashing, which are essential in this way. Okay, and to finalize, you don't need to write everything by yourself. There are smart people which are doing this. Uh, frankly, all of them are in academia, and those projects, some of them, like, about they are quite academic and the very last one which is actually I'm, I'll be advertising I like it it's still in zero and one alpha yeah but it looks very promising so uh, what these databases do these databases implement those tricks and uh, they hide them behind uh, query languages which happen to be SQL queries and they enable you to deal with samples of data they pre-sample data for you and this is very important because sampling data is much trickier than actually I just explained to you when you go to depths because your data is likely to be skewed. You're not likely to be always see the same data. You will have some cycles. So this BlinkDB is comparing itself against, well, Hadoop and uh, Spark and Spark with caching, without caching. And BlinkDB was one person error. What is one percent error if you are dealing with terabytes of data? It's like nothing. I have to say you that this is a log scale. So this means that actually between this number of blink DB, it's a query response time in seconds. We are 100 times, no, 10 times better than the nearest uh, algorithm. And yeah, and something like hundred times better than Hadoop without caching. So how does it work and how it looks like? It's like, it's magic. You say SQL query and tell me that I want to get this average for last two seconds. Oh, I'm sorry, for, for, for in two seconds. So just constraining it by time and it will reply you in two seconds at most. Or you are um, trying to <coughs> get a bound on the confidence. What's happening behind here? This database is good only for aggregates. You would not be using it for querying get me element number seven. No, this is, it'll be wrong database completely. But if you were to do any data analysis, any cubes, if you're familiar, familiar with or all those tableau analysis, this is like magic when you can just get approximate value because nobody in business development actually cares about that accuracy. They, will, they won't notice. They're just going to, okay, data losses somewhere. But you'll get in two seconds reply. And actually, that works, despite it being version 0, 1 alpha. It's, it has limited uh, number of functions you can call. Uh, all those functions are having, uh, well, some of those data structures hidden behind. And there is a structure of a very large uh, scale how it, how it will try to organize the data. Basically, it has very sophisticated sample module which uh, splits data 
in uniform sample in order to do preliminary lookups uh, even before getting into the exact answer to the query you asked, the database will, will, will take a look in a small uniform sample and plan its query on it, which data structure to need and which parameters for the data structure to select. And then, uh, just because it's already sampled in a very nice way, it has guarantees over these samples, it can actually work only with parts of your data. And it happened to be nicely distributed across cluster, and it can interrupt itself at any time or when the confidence bounds will be reached. And also just because you can get confidence bounds limited, it can only deal with, you can be fine with dealing with in-memory samples. Uh, these samples which are, uh, they call the stratify, they're basically, uh, they're trying to get as fair as possible sample for each particular case. And uh, I think this is it. References. Uh, this is a very great book to read. If you would to have any desire to follow, I would really encourage you to look through the content of this book. Just, just read content for you to know where to look later if you will have any need in those approaches. And um, what's to take out? So this is a nice slide which was presented by Ilya Yakovsov and he was trying to visualize what's the benefits of having the whole big data set, 40 megabyte, which is uh, actually, frankly, would say it's very small for these problems. Don't play with database, with data sets that are, if your data set can fit in memory without any problem, you don't need any probabilistic data structures. It will be much quicker for you to fit in the memory. And this is my first summary, no, also, what sacrifice, control to errors, and first I actually missed, know when not to use it. Don't use it if you don't need to, frankly, but in some cases it's amazing because here's the memory consumption for other uh, data structures. We were discussing uh, frequencies of the top 100 elements from that data structure. We were discussing uh, exact membership cardinality. We didn't discuss, it's basically we storing table of all elements and exact as you can imagine, Python dictionary. Membership <coughs> query with 4% error Bloom filter. Bloom filter takes a bit of memory if you want to control errors nicely. Uh, cardinality estimation, uh, it's a hyperlog log. In our case, we were discussing cardinality estimation with uh, another error, it's a linear counter. So it's basically less efficient and I'm not sure if you would they have any need to use those algorithms if you will have special case for those? And what's here? An exact frequency to compare if we to use probabilistic data structures for frequency or like this or exact frequencies. Exact membership or Bloom filter membership. And um, last things, um, always control errors. Don't know no to using this methods if you are not confident in your errors. If you use algorithms which don't give you boundaries, precise boundaries and expected boundaries of your uh, error, you just uh, should be running an ex empirical experiment and look at the worst performance they deliver and just see how those results are distributed. And yeah, know that you're sacrificing with your accuracy and it's not always good when you're dealing with 40 megabyte of data. Okay, thank you. <laughs>